You're a bundle of nerves. You're all such a bundle of nerves. All this love. It's that magic lake. But what can I do to help my child? What? What? That's Dr. Dorn ending Act One of The Seagull. And it is so exemplary of the whole play, and it's certainly the first act. A group of people who are a bundle of nerves attracted to a magic lake. It's the first act of The Seagull. I ask you now, please join me into this journey of The Seagull by Anton Chekhov. My name is Nathan Thomas. I'm professor of theater at Alvernia University in Reading, Pennsylvania. And I'm so glad that you joined me for this look into the world of The Seagull, a play by Anton Chekhov. The last time we met, we had a brief introduction of the play, a look at the life of Anton Chekhov, and a brief introduction of the characters. This time, we want to take a detailed look in Act One and start our in-depth view of these characters, the characters who so many people have said revolutionized how we look at theater. Last time, we did happen to mention that often Chekhov is compared favorably with Shakespeare as a playwright, someone who has done great things in terms of being able to create characters in new and interesting and very in-depth ways. One of the things that we'll find is that these characters have aspirations and dreams and have a great deal of uh, well-roundedness, almost like they were real people. And what is interesting, too, in terms of a general introduction to this act, is that we will see in the opening part um, one of the techniques that Shakespeare used Chekhov liked Shakespeare rather a lot and had read uh, a number, if not all, of Shakespeare's plays in translation into Russian. And he uses some of the techniques that Shakespeare himself used. One of the things that Shakespeare does in many of his plays is to set up what I call mirrors or twins, where you have a, a, a father and a daughter and a father and a daughter, and you have those two sets, and you're able to see how this works out. Or you have a parent and a child and a parent and a child. Or you have a pair of lovers and another pair of lovers. And those pairs can show comparisons and contrasts to help us understand the characters, the situations they're in, and how they react to the events of the play. Act one of The Seagull starts off with a, with a number of different scenes in which we see pairs of people. So first we see Masha and Medvedenko in a scene, followed by Soren and his nephew Treplev, followed by Treplev with his girlfriend Nina, and then we see Paulina and Dorn. So within these first four chunks of Act One, we see three different pairs of romantic partners, Masha and Medvedenko, Nina and Treplev, and Paulina and Dr. Dorn. All three couples have complicated uh, pasts and are going to be even more complicated as the play continues. Let's take a look also at the characters and remind ourselves of who, are, who we're going to be joining as we go into this world. First, the owner of this estate where we are is Pyotr Soren. He's an older man, he has been in service, and he feels like his life has not amounted to much. He was never someone who rose to the top of anything. He was sort of a middle manager, and now he's in his reclining years, in this time and place, to be uh, in your early 60s was to be considered an old person at the turn of the 20th century. And so... One of his uh, dear friends who comes and visits, visits him on a regular basis is Dr. Dorn. And Soren and his friend Dr. Dorn have, will have regular conversations about what it is to live and 
whether or not one should draw out living just for the sake of being alive or what that actually means. Then we have the pairs of lovers. Masha, who is the daughter of the uh, man who runs this farm, uh, Masha is a very interesting young woman, and she has attracted the attentions of the local schoolmaster, Medvedenko. Medved is the Russian word for bear, so we can think of Mr. Medvedenko almost like uh, Chekhov is saying he's like Mr. Bear. Medvedenko, we will find out, has a great deal of love and passion for Masha, which is not always reciprocated. Then we have Nina and Treplev. Nina is literally the young girl who lives next door. She's about 19 years old. Masha's about 19, 20 years old. Treplev is about 19, 20 uh, to 25 years old, if you take the text uh, as gospel. And so uh, these young people, uh, Nina and Treplev, have uh, gotten to know each other. And Treplev is very taken with Nina. And then we have Paulina and Dr. Dorn. Paulina is the wife of the farm manager, Shemrayev. And she, we find out, has had an illicit affair with Dr. Dorn for some time. Where that affair is at the time of the play is also an interesting question. So as Act One begins, we'll visit each of these couples along with a conversation between uh, uncle and nephew, Soren and his nephew, Treplev, about what's going on and the visit of uh, Treplev's mother, Arkadina, an actress, and her boyfriend, uh, Tregorin, who is a writer, a very famous writer. That gives us a brief introduction to all of the characters, and we'll talk more about them as we look uh, more in more detail as we go into the act. One last thing, and by means of uh, general uh, remarks, is that as we go through the play, the first act takes place by the lakeside of the Soren estate. As we go through each act, we will find that space continually gets restricted. Restricted, and then restricted, and then restricted even further. And so act one takes place out in the wild, open uh, shoreline of a lake that has islands, and while you can hear things from the other side of the lake, you may not be able to see the other side of a lake. So this is a fairly substantial uh, body of water that we're talking about. So let's start with our first couple in this, uh, in this play, Masha and Medvedenko. And the very first lines of the play, which are famous lines, Why is it you always wear black? I'm in mourning for my life. I'm unhappy, is the reply. Now, the stage directions are very straightforward. We're in the back lawn of Soren's estate. A small stage has been set up at the lakeside. A few chairs, a bench, a small table. It's just before sunset. On the little stage behind the curtain, Yakov and another worker are busy sounds of coughing and hammering. Masha and Medvedenko enter, returning from a walk. Now, as we're introduced to Masha and Medvedenko, we'll find that Medvedenko is vastly, vastly taken with Masha. He says, I walk miles here every day and walk miles home, and I do that every day because I love you so much. I love you, I love you, I love you. And Masha's response, as he says, is indifferentism. It's not that she hates him, but she's indifferent to him. But we also have these first two lines. And this first scene between Masha and Medvedenko is a scene that we could uh, take a whole semester just dealing with this one scene because it's both interesting and as complicated as any two human beings would be in this situation. First, we have to realize that in a Chekhov play is just because someone says something, it doesn't mean that they believe it or that it's necessarily true. I'll give you an example. In Uncle Vanya, there is a visiting professor who comes to a country estate. In that sense, there are some similarities between uh, Uncle Vanya and the seagull. And the professor comes in and his very first line is, what wonderful views. 
Now, in Act 3 of Uncle Vanya, we find out that uh, the, the surrounding countryside has been uh, systematically denuded of trees and forestation. And so you wonder what views happen to be left out in this place. Because with rising industrialization, all that we used to think of as, as nature and things to look at have been taken away. So when the professor says, oh, what wonderful views, is he being ironic? Is he saying something to be polite? We really don't have a sense of that in terms of reality. And so consequently, the same is true here. Just because Medvedenko says, why do you always wear black? We can't be certain in Chekhov's world that she does, in fact, always wear black. And because she says she's in mourning for her life, that she's unhappy, we can't be sure that she's saying that because she's unhappy or because she's trying to deflect Medvedenko's attentions. It's also more interesting because what this is, is a, a kind of a quote from uh, a piece of literature by Maupassant, a French writer. So is this something where Medvedenko and Masha have been walking along for a little while and trying to figure out what to say? Medvedenko asks this question, hoping to, because he's a teacher, trying to show some savoir-faire, and so that he can quote that he knows Maupassant, who also will show up in this play again as someone who is quoted? Or is it in fact because she always wears black and she is in mourning for her life and she is unhappy? Chekhov does not answer those questions. It is up to the director and the actors to answer these and many other questions that will be coming down the pike as we continue on. And at this point, it's probably useful to talk a little bit about Stanislavski. Konstantin Stanislavski was a great innovator of acting at the turn of the 20th century. His books on acting have become the Bibles for actors and for actor training throughout the world. What are some of the things that Stanislavski stood for? Well, one of the things that Stanislavski did was develop a kind of analytical tool to help actors, and part of it came out of his work on Chekhov. And it has to do with the aspirations of the character. And that is to ask ourselves, what is the character's motivation? Now, probably even people who have never been in plays know about this sort of typical scenario where a director would come up to an actor and say, well, what's your character's motivation in this scene? What's their objective? What's their goal? We use a number of different words in the theater that mean mainly the same thing. And then the actor would talk about that and then work to show uh, that striving towards that goal or that objective in the behavior and the tasks that they do as they continue through a scene. How do we find what our motivation is? Well, Stanislavski developed a three-step system. It's fairly straightforward. One is, is that characters in plays have problems. Very few plays are about characters who are happy, having a good day. So these characters have problems, and it's up to the actor to figure out what is the main problem in this particular part of the scene or this part of the act. And that is a problem that, once you identify the problem, is like almost like a mathematical problem. If you write out a mathematical problem, it almost suggests its own means of solution. You know how to solve the problem. And then you have to figure out what are the means or the tactics by which you're going to use to solve that problem. So say, for example, I have a, a difficulty in uh, getting from where I am to Los Angeles. So I need to get to Los Angeles. I live in Pennsylvania. So how am I going to do it? Uh, strategically, I might need to get to Los Angeles, but there are many different ways that I can use. I could walk. That would be the longest way. Or I could take a dirigible if I knew someone who, who had a Zeppelin. Or I could take a jet or I could get in the car and drive. And if I'm going to get in the car and drive, well, which route am I going to take? And that's what an actor has to figure out in terms of thinking about their character. What is the problem? Well, it's a problem that's solvable by doing something and then using our heart and our mind as actors 
to follow through and and achieve that goal. And either you will achieve it or you won't. Now, in a comedy situation, often what we find funny are people who do not succeed in what they set out to do. For example, Charlie Chaplin as the little tramp so often failed at what he set out to do. In the introduction, I mentioned Wiley E. Coyote in the Roadrunner cartoons. The coyote never succeeds in capturing the Roadrunner. What we enjoy seeing in those instances are the coyote's failures. And so we have this with Masha and Medvedenko in this first scene from The Seagull. Medvedenko is trying to impress himself upon Masha as someone who is a good person, someone who is able with money, someone who is trying to woo and romance this young woman. The problem is he's not very good at it. And so that's what happens. He talks about the amount of money he makes as a school teacher, and he tries to get some conversation going. Masha does not help. Medvedenko points out that there's going to be a play tonight that uh, Nina is going to star in that was written by uh, Treplev, and that because of this common aesthetic of endeavor, that Nina and Treplev's souls are going to mingle. There is some enmeshing between playwright and performer in a way that does not happen for him and Masha. And he says, all I get from you is indifferentism. And I walk here so many miles and, and I go home, but I do it every day because I love you, I love you. And she says, I know that you love me, it's touching, I just don't love you back. And then Masha takes snuff. Snuff is a, is a form of ground up uh, fermented tobacco. And what you do is you put a little, usually, in the curve between your thumb and your forefinger and lift it to your nose and you sniff it directly into your nose and you get a little jump from it uh, in terms of uh, a, a little bit, uh, uh, almost a narcotic effect. Uh, it's not quite narcotic, but there you go. And it's a pick-me-up. And Masha takes snuff in this way. And uh, Medvedenko is a smoker himself in the original production, smoked uh, cigarettes, no problem. But Masha now offers him some snuff and he does not take it. Now, this is an interesting sideline in this very first scene. Medvedenko loves Masha. Masha is somewhat indifferent to Medvedenko, but you have to ask yourself, if you're Masha, why do you stay and talk to this person? And, spoiler alert, as we will find out in Act 4, she will eventually get married to this man and have children with him. So what is there about this conversation. It's not simply a matter she wants to get away from him, because if she wanted to, she could. She's the daughter of the farm foreman. Her mother probably helps out in the house. She could very easily say, I have chores to do. I have something else to do to take me away from this time and place, and could very easily leave Medvedenko behind. But she doesn't. And then she goes out of her way to offer him something, and he doesn't accept her offer of snuff. He says, no, I'm not really feeling like any right now. Now, she makes an offer. This is a kind gift of hospitality, but it's not something that he can accept for whatever reason. And so we start to see, even in this first scene, this complicated uh, series of connections between these two people. Before we leave this first scene, I want to make one last point point. And that is that uh, there's an old saying in the theater, which is that uh, when the lights go out or when the curtain opens, the audience is in trouble. You have to imagine what it is for uh, an audience sitting in the theater. They may or may not have a program. They may or, if even they had one, they may not have read it. But the lights go down, the curtains open, whatever to indicate the start of the play. And all of a sudden, we have two people. We're coming to see a play called The Seagull, and these two people start talking. What does this tell you? And the interesting thing is that in very uh, clear shorthand, Chekhov is able to get a lot of information to the audience. 
One, you have a young man who's in love with a young woman who is indifferent to him. This is something that we're going to see again throughout the play. We understand that we're at a place in the country. We understand that there's going to be a play, a play within a play. So it's very theatrical in that way. And we learn that the play is going to be written by a character we haven't seen yet and acted by a woman we haven't seen yet, but they're going to be coming on. And we're told by these two characters that those two characters who are putting on the play, that playwright and actress, are in love with each other so much that their souls are going to mingle in putting on this play. So with very spare effort on Chekhov's part, we in the audience learn an awful lot. And that in just basically a page and a half of text. Next, we'll have a scene between Treplev and Soren. between Soren and Treplev, accomplishes also quite a lot. It is the uncle and the nephew, the old man and the young man, having a lengthy conversation, and in the conversation talking about their common family member, Treplev's mother, and Soren's sister. And we don't get there immediately because we have one of these seams that uh, seems between the two conversations in which the seam is is very easily uh, melded together so that Masha and Medvedenko are given a task to go see where other people are and to get them out of the way. And Treplev is waiting for Nina to show up to put on the play. And that gives Soren an opportunity to have a conversation with his nephew. Now, this is a challenge for any playwright. I tend to joke a little bit about Ibsen and how he deals with exposition and getting information out. And also, for that matter, George Bernard Shaw. Is if you read George Bernard Shaw's Man and Superman at the beginning of the play, you have a lengthy conversation between a mother and a son where the mother says, well, there's so much about the family I haven't told you. Now sit down. I'm going to tell you all about it. And this is a scene that goes on for a number of minutes so that we as the audience can understand all that's going to happen in the remainder of the play. Likewise, in Ibsen, I make the joke that someone comes in and says, oh, I haven't been here for seven years. Tell me what's been going on while I was away. In this instance, you have uh, two family members talking and an uncle and a nephew, people who've seen each other on a regular basis and see each other on a regular basis, but as family members are able to talk about what's going on in the family. In this instance, about Treplev's mother, the actress Arkadina. And we learn all kinds of things about Soren, about Treplev, and, of course, about Arkadina. We learn that, of course, there's going to be a play and that the play is causing some consternation in Madame Arcadena because she herself is an actress. And we learn that uh, she gets bored being out in the country. Now, we're going to be talking uh, a lot about Arcadena, and I think it's probably useful here to talk about, when we talk about the seagull, who is the seagull and... Who is the, for want of a better word, the star of the show? Who is the play about? One of the interesting things about the seagull is that you could point to this character or that character or another character and say, oh, this play is about this person. But then as you delve deeper into it, you realize that no, it's not about that character. It's about this character. Well, it's not about this character. It's about that character. And so truly... In many ways, The Seagull is an ensemble piece. It is about the group of them. It is not about any one of them. Arcadena tends to stand out a little bit because it's a showy part, but she does not necessarily command all of the stage time as we would think of as a star turn. And uh, 
there are places in which one might think that Treplev is the seagull. He associates himself with the seagull at one point. Nina certainly does. But is Arkadina also the seagull? In any case, uh, a few words here about Arkadina. We learn some of this from Treplev, but also there are some elements here to, to understand something about what it is to be a single mother actress in the late 19th century. And this is something that the original audience would have been very familiar with, but we are less familiar today. In the Russia that Arkadina was being an actress in, there were no social safety nets available. There was no social security. There was no union pension. In fact, there was no union. And an actress was responsible for her own costumes, her own upkeep, her own bookings. There were no agents. She was responsible for absolutely everything. So a lot of charges are going to be leveled against Madame Arcadena, that she is a miser, that she... Uh, has a challenge because she's an, getting to be an older woman. She's in her early 40s, but she goes out with younger men. In particular, her current boyfriend, Trigorin, is younger. Um, why does she behave this way? Well, she behaves this way because she is a single woman with no visible means of support other than herself. No viable means of support other than than herself. And so consequently, who is going to look out for Arcadena as she reach, reaches the age in which people are going to be no longer interested in seeing her? There's a sad theater story that I think about from time to time. In the late 19th century in America, there was an actress named Matilda Heron. Matilda Heron in the heyday of the mid-19th century was a vivacious actress who had done a, her own translation of The Lady of the Camellias, a romantic play by uh, Dumas Fee that was turned into the movie starring Greta Garbo. So it's that kind of a role. And uh, there are reports of her as she reached into her dotage, into her 60s and 70s, where she would still have to go and find a theater somewhere. And these are in small provincial towns here in America, you know, a small town in rural Georgia or a small town in North Carolina somewhere. She tried to find places that were a little bit warmer and where they would uh, want to see her do an act of the Lady of the Camellias. Far past her best. And the reports that we have are really kind of sad. But what else could she do? There was no other way for her to earn or get any money. She uh, hadn't married and had no other means of income. What was she supposed to do other than her profession? And that's true for Arcadena. She's very conscious of the fact that her career has a shelf life. And she's very conscious of that. Even in our own show business culture of today, an actress in her 40s is not going, as we know from any number of different stories that we read in the media, is not going to get cast in the same way that that same woman would have gotten cast in her early 20s. Certainly true at the turn of the 20th century. So Arcanina is not, um, is, is not unreasoned or irrational in some of the choices that she makes in her life. But we find out about these choices as Treplev and Soren talk about her. We find out that, according to Treplev, that Arkadina is furious because Nina's the star and she isn't. And we learn that uh, Madame Arkadina probably is very good as a nurse, is very good at taking care of people. She is not a thoughtless or heartless person. She's a caring person. But she has other, uh, she has other uh, aspirations. She has other things that motivate her other than just her heart. Treplev also notes that uh, Madame Arkadina knows all of the poetry of Nekrasov by heart. Who was Nekrasov? He was a poet who lived 
about uh, 20 years prior to the time of the play, and was noted for his support of feminist issues within the realm of his culture at the time, and was sort of uh, uh, someone for the people and writing for the people. And so you get a notion from this that Madame Arcadena uh, is someone who Treplev wants to say her heart's in the right place, but something has happened. And Treplev, as her son, is not fully empathetic to some of the issues that I just raised with you about uh, her mother's, his mother's aging, uh, what it means to be an actress, and what it means to continue to get a career and have a career and be sufficient, self-sufficient, in a time and a place where it's very hard for women to do anything at all. So uh, she does melodramatic parts, and we find out that she she's very good at them over the course of the play. But it's a kind of theater that Treplev does not like. Treplev is not someone who is interested in traditional theater of the melodramatic kind. He is interested in finding something new. And the other thing, of course, is that his mother, when he's not around, she's 32. She claims to be a much younger woman. And she can't claim to be 32 with a son who's 25. That would be uh, very shocking. And we find out that she is, in fact, in her early 40s. We also find out that she is going out with a very famous writer. And I want to talk about this. We'll talk about this a little bit more with Nina. But useful to introduce it here is that we are in a time and a place before electronic media. And so consequently, who are the rock stars, who are the famous personalities within the culture at this time, writers. And we'll talk more about that uh, when we meet Nina for the first time. And Soren uh, asks himself, asks, well, who is this writer? What is her boyfriend like? And Treplev, we find out, doesn't have much use for his mother's boyfriend. And this is not really surprising. Um, Treplev says that Trigorin, the writer, is kind of ordinary, doesn't say much, he's not dumb, he's young. Um, and we get the notion that Trigorin is, is someone who is very much of his time and his place and is very popular. Now, whether or not that also makes him a good artist or even a great artist is something that is going to also be talked about throughout the play. What is the difference between popular art and great art? Can popular can something that's popular also be very artistic? This is a question that people continue to ask and talk about and argue back and forth. Uh, we see it in our movies today. Is there something like uh, a superhero movie uh, that is enormously popular and gets a lot of money? Does that mean because it's a superhero movie and earns a lot of money that uh, it's not also art? These are questions that Chekhov's uh, characters are asking and uh, come up with very different answers, as we do when we have those conversations today. Finally, of course, we find out that uh, Soren had many aspirations as a younger man, and one of those was to be a literary person himself. And just as he makes this revelation, we fear footsteps, and who should come in but Nina. Nina is literally the girl next door. Now, as I said before, Chekhov had read Shakespeare, and he obviously knew Hamlet. It's going to be quoted later on in Act One. And this goes to the relationship between Hamlet and Ophelia. Uh, are, were Hamlet and Ophelia actual physical lovers? What was the nature of their romance? The same question can be asked here of Treplev and Nina, is that we get the idea over the course of the play that Treplev has a lot of attentions towards Nina. Uh, Nina has restrictive parents in the same way Ophelia does in Hamlet. And were they in the midst of a physical relationship when the events of the play happen? Were they chased uh, romantically? Or what was the nature of that? We don't know. 
And so the answers to those questions are going to paint for the actors and the directors very interesting conclusions depending upon how you answer those questions. So Nina rushes on, and here we have the, the challenge of acting Nina. And there are so many challenges for the, uh, for the woman who plays Nina. And this is one of them. She's running in from off stage, but you have to get the notion that her home across the lake is not just next door. And she's a woman who's running. She claims to have run here. She doesn't get horses. And she's in late 19th century shoes. She's corseted, likely. And she's running all of this way. So what condition is she in when she finally arrives here at Soren's farm? Here we now have a very brief scene. It lasts barely a minute, minute and a half between Nina and Treplev when they're finally alone. We're alone. And in the Russian word for alone also means we're one. Are they in fact joined? This is something that Medvedenko says in his scene with Masha that Treplev and Nina are in some way linked. Is that in fact true? Is that the case? And what does Nina think about this? We do not find out. And um, the events of the play might throw some of the answers to that question uh, into a wide variety of different places. I thought I heard someone there. No, no one. They kiss. What is the nature of the kiss? There are all kinds of different kisses. And so for a stage kiss, is this something that... Uh, is passionate, more passionate for one than the other? Is it a peck on the cheek? There is so much in the dramaturgy of Chekhov's plays that are in the physical action and not necessarily in the words themselves. Sometimes, as we indicated before, the words might lead you down an incorrect path because the characters may be saying things for all kinds of different reasons. What kind of tree is that? Elm. Why is it so dark? Because the sun is starting to set. Shadows get longer. Don't go back early tonight. Please don't. I must. What if I followed you home, Nina? I would stand all night in the garden. Look up at your window. You can't. The watchman doesn't know who you are, and Treasure doesn't know you. He'd bark. Treasure is Nina's dog. And it's interesting because Chekhov had a friend whose dog's name was Treasure. Treplev says... I love you, and Nina replies, shh, shh, does she love him back? She doesn't say. Is she trying to stop him from saying more about love? Or is something else going on? And then, of course, there's noise. So our introduction to our main romantic couple, we think, Treplev and Nina is very short, very spare, very brief words. And this is the thing about Chekhov, even in his native Russian, is that he doesn't use some expansive vocabulary. He uses short, spare words, pauses, everyday words, pauses, an act, an action. And, and you see into the lives of these people. So while we might think this is very nice, here's a young man, here's the girl next door, he says he's in love, they kiss, he says, I love you, she says, shh. But we can see, even in this short spare scene, that there is a lot more going on than meets the eye. And then Nina and Treplav have a conversation that they know is being overheard by Yakov and the other workers who are finishing up the stage for the evening's play. And we hear for the first time that Nina is interested in meeting Arkadina's boyfriend, Trigorin. Now, we mentioned before that writers in this time and place got to be very famous. And if you think about it, this is the age of Dickens. This is the age of Mark Twain, when a writer and novelist can also go out and, and do uh, a lecture series and travel all over the world. Uh, Oscar Wilde is also doing this in the 1890s. 
and making a fair amount of money doing this. These are almost in the nature of international personalities. And so Tregoran is of, of that kind. And so you have to ask yourself, if you're Nina, if you were going to meet a very famous person, what would that be like for you? Tregoran is like that for Nina. He writes such wonderful stories, and Treplev says, I don't know, I don't read him. And at that point, Nina, for the very first time, starts to offer a little bit of criticism to her young man, Treplev, and she says, you know, your play isn't that easy to act, and the whole thing, there's not one ordinary person. And Treplev says, ordinary person, we have to show life not the way it is, or the way it should be, but the way it is in dreams. And she says something very interesting. Nothing happens in the play. It's like reading through one long speech. And I think a play ought to have a love story. One of the things that Chekhov enjoys is being metafictional. This is something that has been a long part of Russian letters, particularly in the 19th century, coming out of the work of Gogol. And consequently, Chekhov also picks this up. Uh, the comment about Treplev's play has been something that has been talked about in terms of Chekhov's play, The Seagull, is that nothing happens in the story, and I think a play ought to have a love story, and who says that but a character in a love story. Nina and Treplev run off and are replaced by, by Paulina and Dorn, and we find out that Paulina likes to look out for Dr. Dorn, we find out that Dr. Dorn sings songs. I have to admit, of all of the characters in The Seagull, the one who I've often found most puzzling, particularly when I was a younger man, was Dr. Dorn. But as I get older, I understand Dr. Dorn a little bit better. And particularly, there's a, there's a curious aspect to Chekhov's life that some of his biographers have also mentioned. And that is, for Chekhov, is that the closer he would get to certain women, the less he wanted to be involved with them. And I think that there's something to this with Dr. Dorn. And there's also some practical elements to this as well. Uh, they have had an affair. On the other hand, if it becomes a matter of public scandal, there are a lot of consequences for him and for Paulina that I don't think Dr. Dorden would like to see occur. And so, consequently, uh, they keep things very quiet. And to deflect Paulina's ardor, and notice the difference here, is when we saw Medvedenko with Masha, it was the young man who was pressing the romance, with Nina and Treplev, it seems a little bit more balanced, but then on the other hand, at the end, with I love you, shh, again, perhaps there's something more there with the man having a little bit more um, amora to him than the woman does in that relationship. But when we get to Paulina and Dorn, it is Paulina who is the aggressor. And Dorn, who presses back a little bit, is a little bit reticent. And the way he does that is through singing little songs. And these little songs are little snatches of songs, not a full song. One of the challenges to the actor playing Dr. Dorn, and I've seen this in rehearsal and in performance, is that the actor playing Dr. Dorn almost wants to sing their little song and get, get past it so they can say the line. And I think that's almost always wrong. I think that the actor playing Dr. Dorn needs to relish the song and realize that uh, it could be a variety of different things. There's the old cliche almost, right, that I, you're very attractive when you get riled up. By singing these little songs, Dorn gets Paulina riled up. She gets more and more excited. Does he find that attractive? Is he doing this so that he can get her uh, into an area of excitement that he likes to see her? Or is it something that he is genuinely deflecting and wanting not to get too involved in? There are lots of possibilities for these little snatches of song that Dr. Dorn sings. We also find out that Dr. Dorn is 55 years old, 
And we find out that he's had relationships with women. And so it's highly likely from how he says it that Paulina is not the only woman that he's had an affair with. And then we find out that he was an obstetrician. So in our Me Too time today, we have to wonder to what extent Dr. Dorn is, uh, he's a serial philanderer, but what does that mean? And to what extent were all of those women willing participants? That being the case, we certainly can't say that Paulina is in any way uh, on the wrong end of this relationship. She is the one who very definitely is pressing her her uh, ardor, trying to woo Dr. Dorn. Shamrayev points out that uh, uh, he's had relationships with women and that he never took advantage of his patients. And again, we see the same sort of thing happening with Paulina and Dr. Dorn at the end of their scene that we saw with Nina and Treplev at the end of their scene. Paulina says, my dear, not quite the same thing as saying, I love you. And Dorn, instead of saying shh, says shush. And then why people are coming. He doesn't want them to be caught having a romantic tete-a-tete at this particular time. And at this point, we've had these four short little chunks of scenes. The remainder of the act, except for a code at the end, now will involve the whole cast. And this is where an ensemble occurs. We start to get introduced to the other characters of the play in almost kind of a parade-like way. Shamrayev, as he does several times in the play, brings up actors in the theater from the long past, which, of course, only emphasizes for Arkadina that she is older than what she would like to be thought. We see Dr. Dorn, in reaction to something that Shamrayev says, says, oh, yes, there aren't any geniuses left today, that's true, but I think acting in general has improved, particularly in the smaller parts. And that's Dr. Dorn saying that as an actor playing Dr. Dorn in a play where he's playing one of the arguably smaller parts. And then Shamrayev tries to bring it off with a little bit of Latin that is not very well done. Then we have Arkadina and Treplev quoting from Hamlet. And this particular bit is from the uh, closet scene where Hamlet confronts his mother about her uh, relationship with uh, Hamlet's uncle, his father's brother, and how disgusting that is to Hamlet. And so it's very interesting here that uh, Treplev should choose this portion of Hamlet to bring this to his mother's attention and to do it in front of everyone, including her boyfriend. The interesting thing, of course, is that in this act, Trigorin barely says a thing. He has maybe two or three lines in the entire act. So what is Trigorin's reaction to this? We don't know. He does not say. And then we have the play within a play. Now, there are two different things I'd like to point out here. Number one is, is that uh, at the time the Chekhov is writing the seagull, there's an artistic uh, energy that we now call symbolism. At the time, they called it a number of different things, and as Madame Arcadena points out, decadence. Uh, it's kind of an art for art's sake kind of a movement where a group of playwrights and theater people were looking in some way to reawaken a very uh, fundamental and almost going back to the basics way of thinking about theater. People in this uh, pre-World War I era, the, what's called the fin de sickle period, is these people were, th were trying to think that, uh, were dealing with the fact that they thought Ziff civilization was tired, something needed to be renewed, we needed to find something deeper, we needed to have more connection with each other as human beings. And so they looked to the theater to answer some of these questions, and they looked to the ancient theater, to the ancient Greeks, and they also looked to the Commedia del art tradition of Renaissance Italy and those traditional theatrical characters 
to represent things and to look at things like uh, happiness with a capital H, death with a capital D, to see personifications and anthropomorphizing these concepts. So that, for example, uh, a Belgian playwright will write a play called The Blue Bird, and it's about two children looking for the blue bird of happiness. It's their search for happiness in the search for this blue bird. Or you might have some mystics who are waiting for death to appear as in Alexander Bloch's play, Puppets at the Fairground Booth. And uh, when death, with a capital D, arrives, it's not death, it's Columbina, a character from the Italian Renaissance Commedia dell'Arte tradition. And the play also has Perrault and Harlequin in it. So we can see that there is this art for art's sake uh, movement that's going on. Chekhov is not part of this movement. He knows the writers. He knows these people. And in the play within a play, he is both at the same time honoring them, but also uh, satirizing them a little as well. This particular play within a play is unusual. It's a monologue. It's written for one actor with, with effects. And the actor here is Nina. And she's going through this uh, play within a play. Now, this is a very difficult play, the play within a play, because um, it can seem at first glance to be just repetition. And again, one of the challenging parts if you're playing Nina is working how to figure out how to do this. But I want to uh, take us through the play within a play, a little bit step by step. The play within a play is interesting because it starts off with lists of everything that is going to be gone out of the earth at some indescribably long future period of time. Humans, lions, eagles, quail, deer, geese, going all the way even to the smallest, you know, uh, smallest, almost uh, slightly bigger than molecular creatures, that all life is going to be gone. In the same way that Earth at one point was lifeless, it will be lifeless again at some indescribable point in the future. And in that period of time, still there's going to be some bit of universal soul or spirit and something that includes all of the spirit of the world, everything from Napoleon to the smallest microbe that's going to be part of this universal spirit and that is going to be eternal and last in some way. And that that universal part of life is going to remain unchanged, unchanged. But for the time being, this universal soul is imprisoned. And imprisoned in a deep, deep place that is being guarded, in this case, by the devil which is the material. And so we have this sort of uh, dualism of uh, mind, or, mind or soul and flesh, which is part of Treplev's symbolist play. And as he's going through, he's working to show this, both in terms of Nina's acting, but then to have two lanterns on poles as effects to show uh, the devil's eyes and that... Nina as the universal universal soul is being imprisoned, and he's going to set off a little bit of sulfur. Now, as this continues, his mother gets more and more uh, dismayed at what she's seeing, and she continues to make jokes to the people she's sitting with watching this play. And given that it's his mother, Treplev gets more and more upset. He finally ends the play early, Close, asks Yaakov and the workers to close the curtains, stop the play, and gets so upset at his mother, he just leaves. He can't speak. He goes. 
not knowing what to do, Arkadina asks for him to come back. He doesn't. Masha decides that she's going to go look for him because, frankly, Masha is deeply in love with Treplev and would like nothing more than to be with him. So away she goes to find Treplev. And that incites a little bit of a discussion uh, about the play and about art. And Arkadina says, well, I thought this was going to be a joke, so I treated it like a joke. Earlier when I talked to Treplev, he said this was just kind of a, you know, a little thing. I didn't know he was going to take it so seriously. And then as they're talking, uh, we hear singing from the other side of the lake. And the lake finally is introduced as its own character. And throughout the play now, we're going to hear about the lake as being a magic lake, a lake that helps inspire love and romance in ways both positive and negative. And so finally, what happens is Nina comes out, she meets Tregoran for the first time, and Tregoran, of course, doesn't say much, but what he indicates is a possible double meaning that I enjoyed the play, I guess, I enjoyed you, is essentially what he says. He liked the scenery. He liked what he saw. And so there's that as a possibility. And of course, we learn that he loves to fish. And as a writer, that's what interests him most, is fishing. And then we have Shamrayev telling an old, old joke. One evening at the Moscow Opera, the famous bay Silva hit a low sea. Now, by coincidence, it happened the bass from our church choir was sitting in a second gallery, you know, the balcony, and suddenly we heard from there, Bravo Silva, but a whole octave lower like this, Bravo Silva. The entire theater sat there amazed. Now, this is an old chestnut of a joke, uh, an old shaggy dog story that had made the rounds uh, when all of our great-great-great-great-grandparents were, were small. And so Chekhov gives this old joke to Shamrayev. It gives you a notion of who Shamrayev is to tell that story. And of course, it's a joke that's met not with applause or laughter or even conversation. It's met with silence. And Dorn says, the angel of silence has flown over. Nina has to leave. She has to get back. We have a little bit of chat about her, uh, her parental situation and her restrictive parents. And then everyone decides it's time to go in. It's late, starting to get damp, time to go in. And so they go in. We start to hear music being played in the house. Dorn is left outside. And we have two, as a, as a coda, we have two short conversations. Dorn with Treplev, who comes back and Dorn with Masha, who has been looking for Treplev. We learn from Dorn that he found the play fascinating, interesting, intriguing, and would like to think more of it. And we'll find that this play stays with Dr. Dorn. It really did affect him. His scene with Treplev, he tries to give Treplev a little bit of artistic advice, which Treplev doesn't want to hear. He wonders where Nina has been. He realized Nina has gone, and he's upset at that. And then Masha comes in, and Treplev says, just leave me alone. I, he, he does not want Masha's attentions. And so now again, we have a mirror situation earlier where Paulina was interested in uh, pressing her romantic attentions on Dr. Dorn and was pressed back. Masha seems to be giving attention. We don't know that it's quite romantic yet, but it's certainly giving a lot of attention to Treplev. And he presses back and says, just leave me alone. And he leaves the stage, leaving Masha with Dr. Dorn. Now, uh, this last little scene between Masha and Dr. Dorn. <sighs> Masha takes out her snuff box and uh, Dorn says, ah, youth, and Masha says, everyone who doesn't understand young people says, ah, youth, what a stupid thing to say. She starts to take snuff. He knocks it out of her hands and says, stop that, that's disgusting. And then says, we need to go in the house. And Masha says, wait a minute. What? I want to talk to you. I have to talk to someone. 
I don't like my father. Her father runs the farm. He's the guy who tells bad jokes, bad stories. He's an, we find out he's an ill-tempered guy. He's not a very, he's, he's not someone who's got a lot of depth and a lot of feeling to him. Masha says to Dr. Dorn, I feel attracted to you. I don't know why, but I feel closer to you. Help me, help me for before I do something terrible. I can't go on like this. And now we find out. I love Constantine, Masha says. Masha says, I love Constantine. Now, there are two things that we learn out of this. One is, 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 is implicit, and there's an earlier draft of the play in which it's explicit. Dr. Dorn has had an ongoing affair uh, with Paulina, Masha's mother. Masha does not feel in any way connected to her father, Shemrayev. She feels strangely connected to Dr. Dorn. It was explicit in an earlier draft that Dr. Dorn is her biological father. And so Masha, as a woman who is about 19 or 20 years old, uh, she has some awareness that her mother and father are not in the midst of a physical relationship anymore. She's also probably, she's smart enough to probably be cognizant that her mother has had an ongoing affair with the doctor. So Masha may have put two and two together. Certainly did in an earlier draft of the play. That's the first thing. The second thing we learn is that she's so deeply in love with Constantine and he won't have anything to do with her. This is going to come back again in the play. And then Dorn says, you're a bundle of nerves. You're all such a bundle of nerves. All this love, it's that magic lake. But what can I do to help my child? What? And so ends Act One of The Seagull. I thank you for joining me on this journey into the world of The Seagull and looking at each act in detail. When we come back, we'll be looking at Act Two and a further restriction of space into the croquet lawn. Till then, thank you and stay safe.